Both my husband and I attended here years and years ago, so it's fun to be back. Um, Kip uh, graduated from Colorado State um, after a scholarship playing baseball, and we moved back to Northern California, which is where we're from. And uh, he began uh, working with the company, uh, Novogratic and Company in San Francisco, that's an accounting firm. Um, they so specialized in a low-income housing tax credit, and Kip decided that he would like to uh, learn how to develop those uh, different uh, developments. And um, they, one of the clients offered him a position as a controller with their real estate department, and that moved us to Southern California. And uh, from there he became, um, he accepted a position uh, with Kaufman and Broad uh, with their multi-housing group. And uh, eventually um, the multi-housing group from Kaufman and Broad was purchased by a company out of Denver called Simpson Housing. And while Simpson Housing, with Simpson Housing, he helped build the firm's tax credit development, construction, acquisition, and syndication business into a nationally known operation as well as a major profit center within the company. Uh, during his tenure, he was involved uh, directly in more than 250 uh, support, um, separate affordable multifamily and senior housing developments with about 23,850 units nationwide. Um, in 2004, um, he partnered with uh, a different group and formed um, Wasatch Advantage Group. And uh, WAG specializes in the acquisition, construction, development, financing, and operations of rente rental, multi-housing, commercial, and special projects. Since its formation, uh, he has overseen the acquisition and development of over 3,100 units of affordable housing. Um, oh gosh, I don't know these numbers as well as he does. 400,000 feet of square, square feet of office space and 500 stalls of structured parking. Um, our geographical focus uh, includes most of the western states, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Um, WAG was also recently designated as one of Affordable Housing Finance Magazine's top 10 companies for completing acquisition and affordable housing developers. Uh, he and I have five kids. We live in Southern California. We've been in Orange County for the last 20 years. Um, we have a daughter and four sons, and one of them is currently serving a mission in Tonga. And our daughter is married and lives in Salt Lake City, and our other three boys are with us today. We have twin sons that are 16 and an 11-year-old boy. And right now, uh, my husband is the bishop of the Young Single Adult Ward in our, in our state. So to you. Well, thanks. We're, we're excited to be here. Um, grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today. As my wife mentioned, um, I, I actually, I, I grew up in Northern California in the East Bay of San Francisco. Uh, my parents were both school teachers. Um, had lots of uh, friends that were school teachers. Um, my parents, though, uh, early on, I could tell that they were interested in making sure that we knew people other than other school teachers, and they were constantly introducing us to other people who had different interests and different careers and different professions. And that was a great opportunity for us to get to know a lot of different people and to find out what they did. And they encouraged us to ask questions about what they did for a living and, and for their careers. Um, uh, my wife mentioned that I went to school at Colorado State. Um, I spent two years at Ricks College, uh, now BYU-Idaho. Um, I played uh, baseball there um, and then was offered a scholarship to Colorado State to go play there. Uh, we had a couple different choices, uh, but we felt like Colorado State was the best place for us to go at that time uh, in terms of academics and, and baseball and everything. And so chose, chose that. Uh, I received a degree in accounting and took a job back home in the Bay Area. And one of the things I want to talk with you about today uh, is, is relationships, because relationships are very important. They've been important throughout my career as well. Uh, came home and interviewed with one of the big six accounting firms in their Oakland office, Deloitte, Touche, and Ross, and was, was pretty close to, to accepting a position with them. Um, and a, a, a gentleman whose wife was the young women's president in the ward that my parents were in, and my dad was the young men's president at that time, he had just left Arthur Anderson, another big six accounting firm, and had created this firm with a couple of other ex-Arthur Anderson uh, guys that uh, they were based in San Francisco. And he said, well, have Kip come to interview. Well, I, I, at that time, was really set on going to work for a big six company. Felt like that was the right path for me to go to develop my, my career in accounting. Um, wasn't sure if I wanted to be an accountant long term. But because of a previous relationship with a gentleman who was my Deacon's Corm advisor when I was 12, he became a partner at, at Deloitte & Touche, actually, one of the managing partners in, in New York City. Uh, he really encouraged me to study accounting and said, if you don't end up being an accountant, it's still a great 
uh, set of fundamental skills that you'll use in any business that you're in. And, and, I, and I absolutely agree with them. It's, it's, it's a great skill set to have and has translated into me, into me being able to successfully, or sometimes not successfully, but when it's not successful, at least I know it's coming because I can read financial statements and, and know that it's not going to be successful. So um, it, it was really important for me to do that. But I uh, went to work with um, these guys at this firm, a small firm. As a matter of fact, um, I, w I was in the conference room and sat at the conference desk. That was my desk. There was only uh, three partners, a, uh, a receptionist, myself, and that, that was it in this firm. And one of the, one of the gentlemen there, by na a gentleman by the name of Michael Novogratik, had been with Arthur Anderson, and this is now 1990, so it's four years past what, what was known then as the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which dramatically changed uh, the tax code for America at that time. And he saw this niche as an accountant, which I thought was amazing because sometimes accountants get really singularly focused, but he saw a niche in accounting within affordable housing. In the 1986 Tax Reform Act, there was a section created called Section 42, which governs the low income housing tax credit. And he saw that from an accountant's perspective as an opportunity where whoever uses that tax credit is going to need a tax return and an audit for a minimum of 15 years. And he said, wow, I want to be the guy that provides that to every tax credit project in the country. And so he set out becoming the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the king of tax credits, if you will, from a CPA perspective. And he's been very successful in doing that. Now that company, Novogratz and Company, and Mike Novogratz, who's been asked to testify before Congress and other things about the tax credit, he, they have 13 offices now across the country and have been extremely successful. Um, but I, I got to spend some time with him and watch him develop this and we created a newsletter, a monthly newsletter that I was the editor of. I was just out of college and he said, you, you create these articles and it was from a technical perspective of the tax credit. And so I gained a lot of expertise in studying for these articles that I was writing about the tax credit and its application. Um, we then had a handbook that we published. Uh, so it's silver. It's become known in the industry as the, the silver bible of tax credits and probably doesn't mean anything to anybody in here, uh, but that's, that, that's what it was. And we edited that handbook every year for whenever there was there were tax changes uh, that that impacted that that particular uh, section of the of the uh, internal revenue code section 42 and that was my training was was technical all of my clients at that time were real estate developers and as i got to know them and got to uh, you know got to know their companies more and i would help them with their tax returns help them with their audits uh, I had several other clients as well. What, what, one of my favorite clients was he was a rabbi who's, who, who had a side business as the person who went to kosher uh, food manufacturing plants and blessed the food so that it would be kosher. That was his job. It, it, what, what an interesting job. <laughs> and, and he had his own company and he would show up at these places and I asked him what he would do and he said, well, I go around and I say a blessing and then I have lunch with him. And that's, that's what I do. And he got paid very well for doing that, to, to make sure that they could put on that label, kosher is what it was. So I had a guy who owned a Dodge dealership in Las Vegas. What, what an interesting study of that, of his business and how that worked. Um, I had a guy who was a professional baseball player and a guy who was a stockbroker. All these different, different businesses that I had a chance to dive into and understand a little bit more and see how their businesses worked from an accountant perspective, a, a perspective as we were doing uh, the audits of their, of their uh, financial statements and as we were preparing their tax returns. But my favorite clients became developers. They're the ones that I was most interested in. And all of our, all of our clients all of our developer clients at that time were involved in the tax credit program. So after three years of working with Novogratik, I had this, I was gaining this technical expertise of the application of tax credits to real estate development. And I realized that I want to be a developer and I love this affordable housing. Um, I, 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 I enjoy creating uh, decent, safe, affordable housing for people. It's it. There, 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 there's a a, a great. It's a great byproduct of my job. I don't ever want to sound disingenuous and sound like that's the only reason I do it. I do it as well because it provides for my family. But I also get to do something that really makes me feel good. I've been to uh, many, many open house, uh, grand openings over the years of my communities, where someone will come up to me and say to me, Mr. Shepherd, last week I was living in a car, 
and today I'm living in one of your units. That's a great feeling to know that you've, you've helped someone in, in, their, in their journey of life uh, as, as they move forward. And so that's, a, that's something I enjoy doing and I enjoyed this, but I knew though that if I wanted to become a part of this, I had to understand the real estate development part better. And so I took a job with one of my clients and became a controller of their real estate department and moved down to Southern California with my family. Now, you met my wife, Samantha, and these are three of my boys here. Bennett, stand up really quick, and that's Bennett, and there's Jackson right here, and Walker, and our, our fourth son, as my wife mentioned, is serving a mission in Tonga right now. Uh, he's having a great time. He loves wearing a skirt and wearing flip-flops. Um, he just thinks it's, the, it's awesome. I, I, have to, I don't think we're ever going to get him out of a skirt now. But, um, uh, but uh, and my daughter is married uh, and lives in Salt Lake City with her husband. And actually, she works for my management company. He works for my construction company, and they live in my apartments. But it's, it's good, though. It's good. We're helping him along. So, but. But we, we, I started to work for this company and, and um, uh, came down there and, and really wanted to learn the, the, the real estate development side of this. And I, I met another gentleman who had just come from another company that just failed, um, had, had gone bankrupt. Uh, this is in 1993, a little bit of a slowdown in the, in the real estate market at that time. And, and, and there's a group called Calmark out of Southern California. They had apartments across the country, and, and, and they went belly up. And so Mike was a, de was a developer for them inside of this company. He was one of their partners. And um, Mike had hooked up with the principal of, of the company that I was working for, a guy named Gary Davidson, who was really a dynamic guy. Gary was on the cover of Sports Illustrated four times. He was voted in the, on the 40th anniversary as one of the 40 most influential people on sports. He had a mother who needed housing. And that's how he got into housing, was because he was disappointed that he couldn't find quality, safe housing for his mother at that time for, uh, for an, an elderly person. And so that's how he got in the, in the housing. And Gary was this real dynamic guy. He's always bringing dynamic guys in. I think one of the reasons why Gary liked me is because I was a former baseball player and, and, and you know, could, could kind of talk that, that talk with them and was a little bit outgoing. And Mike, this other guy, Mike Costa there, and, and please listen to these names that I'm saying because I'm going to tie all this in because all these people are people that I met in 1993 or 1990 and they're people that I still work with today. Now we're all gone, we've all gone different paths, but because of those relationships that we forged back then, we're all, we're all helping each other now and doing things. Mike, um, super dynamic guy, uh, uh, understood real estate development. He had a project in, in Claremont, California. It was a senior community that he wanted to, to build, but he couldn't find any financing for it because, as I mentioned before, there was a little bit of a recession, a little bit of a downturn. And Mike came to me and he said, Kip, can you make this tax credit thing work for this, this project for me? And I said, well, well, give me the numbers and I'll put it through there and I'll see if we can make it work. And sure enough, it, it, it worked. And so he said, well, Kip, if you'll put together the, the application for the tax credits and take care of that side of it, I'll, I'll develop this. I said, I'll do that, Mike, under one condition. You gotta, I have to be with you every step of the way because I want to learn real estate development, every, every, every aspect of it. I want to know about title. I want to know about construction. I want to know about management. I want to know about all these different things. And he said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So we, we put this, this thing together, and we, we received an award of the tax credits, and we started to move forward with the project. Now, in the middle of all this, I wasn't aware of this, but... Mike was actually being chased by a group called Kaufman and Broad, who is now KB Home. They're a publicly traded Fortune 500 builder in, in California, the largest builder in the state of California. Um, and he was being uh, chased by them to come and start a multifamily division for their company. Mike and I, Mike said to me one day, he said, Kip, I, this Kaufman and Broad wants to buy these tax credits this project. Now we could spend six hours talking about tax credits, so I won't, I won't do that because I'll bore you to tears. Um, but he says they want to buy these tax credits to use them on their tax return to offset their corporate tax liability. He said, but Kip, I, I, I don't know anything about these tax credits, so you've got to come with me to explain it to them so it makes it look like I know what I'm doing. And I said, well, I'll come with you then, and you handle the real estate questions, and I'll handle the tax credit questions. I didn't know, but this was actually a job interview for Mike. I wasn't aware of this at the time. But we went up there, we met with the CEO of Coffin and Broad by a gentleman by the name of Bruce Carrots, and we met with their secretary, the uh, vice president of uh, 
of Treasury, uh, a guy named Corey Cohen, and we talked with him, and they said, we'll buy these tax credits. Well, four weeks later, Mike said, hey, Kip, I'm leaving. Kaufman Bro just offered me a job. Uh, and and, and uh, they want me to start a multi-housing group for them and they want to develop tax credit projects. And he said, I want you to come along with me and go up there and be the controller of this group. And I said, wow, that, that sounds exciting. And I said, I said, Mike, but I'm really concerned though because as I expressed to you before, I don't want to be a controller for the rest of my life. I want to get into real estate development. And Mike said, well, I, there's no way in the world I could hire you as a project manager because they, they want people who have five to 10 years experience as a project manager, a Fortune 500 company, and that's what they want to have. So I see, he said, but if you come up there and interview as a controller, maybe we can get this, you know, maybe we make the results. I went up there and interviewed as a controller. Well, uh, come on in, Ash. And as, as they were, uh, I get, this is Ash right here. Ash uh, taught me how to surf on Tuesday. <laughs> come on <laughs> Anywhere, anywhere. Come on in and sit down. Okay. Yeah. Fine, Great. Fine. So, uh, in, in between waves, we talked about him coming. So, <laughs> but at, at, at any rate, um, uh, we, we went up there and I interviewed and, and, and Fortune 500 company. Well, not only were they looking for five years experience for the project managers, but they were looking for 10 years experience of someone who was a CPA and a controller. I didn't fit either one of those. I, I, I took part of the exam and passed it, but then took this job and didn't finish it. One of my great regret, regrets in life is not finishing that CPA exam. Finished the CPA exam. Um, went, went, went up there with them, interviewed. They said, no, can't, can't hire you. So I actually didn't get the job. Stayed in touch with Mike. Um, in the meantime, the job I was at, being a controller down at this smaller development company in Southern Orange County, um, I decided that it wasn't the right place for me, wasn't the right environment for me. Um, actually, uh, real, real quick, and um, uh, for the first time in my life, I actually experienced discrimination. Um, there was a gentleman there who, uh, who, who said to me directly, um, because you're a Mormon, um, I'm going to make sure that you don't last very long here. He was very, very direct about it. Um, uh, I, I finally, after a period of time of kind of being somewhat harassed by him, so came home one day. My, I didn't, actually didn't come home. I called, I called uh, Sister Shepherd, uh, uh, and I said, um, "You know what? I, I, I can't do this anymore. This environment's just—it's not good. I'm going to quit." Well, let me we'll tell you what was going on right then. Our, our, we had one child, and our second child had just been born like three weeks, four weeks earlier. And she said to me, well, do you have another job? And I said, no. And she said, well, do you, how, much, how much money do we, I said, we don't have any money. Uh, we, we'll, she said, well, will we get like two weeks pay? I said, no, we won't, I'm quitting. They won't, they're not gonna give me two weeks pay or anything. I'm, I'm quitting, I'm walking out of here today. And so she said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I'm gonna go be a consultant for a while and try that. And so I did that. And, and, and my, my wife, I'm, to this day, I'm not sure why she did that, but she said, Okay, if, if that's what you want to do, then, then, then we'll do that. That's what's going to make you happy. Because she knew I was unhappy. Uh, this was, it, was a, it was a tough period being in that environment. And Mike, my only friend, had just taken this job with Kaufman and Broad. And so I didn't have Mike there either anymore. And so it was kind of a tough environment. We decided that maybe, maybe we need to make this change. So we went off and we started a consulting group. And I, what I did then is I relied on my experience of being this technical guy who had written who had edited the handbook, who was the editor of that newsletter, and I marketed myself to clients as a consultant saying, I'll help you structure your tax credit deal. I'll help you get the financing. I'll make sure you're in compliance with the Internal Revenue Code. I'll do all these things. And, and there, was a, there was a market for it. And because I had that experience, and because Mike Novogratik at the CPA company would constantly tell people as they were coming to him for CPA services, he would say, you ought to talk to Kip. Kip will help you submit the application. Kip will help you get your financing, do these other kind of things. And, and so uh, a relationship was paying off for me. And we had ton, I got tons of referrals from this. And so we actually, and within a very few months, I had more work than I could handle and was actually had a couple of guys that I was hiring to do small things for me. And we went on down that path for about a year and a half. And in the meantime, though, I was gaining some confidence and I put together two tax credit communities myself. One in West Valley, Salt Lake City, and one in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I went through the application process, was awarded the tax credits, and then went to the banks to talk with them about financing. And they said, boy, this looks great, but we don't know who you are, Kip. And, and you know, you don't have a financial statement. You have no 
no credit as far as we can tell. We're not going to be able to give you a loan. So I picked up the phone and I called my buddy Mike Costa at Kaufman and Broad and I said, Mike, I need some help. I've got two communities that are ready to be developed, have the tax credits awarded to them already. They're, they're, they, these things are ready, but I, no bank will finance me. And Mike said, well, how about if I buy them from you? And I said, great. And he said, he said, you know what? I'll bet you I could convince these guys now that you're a real project manager because you put together two deals and what if I give you a job too? Well now we had a decision to make. It was kind of what we'd wanted um, but, but to be honest we, we were making a very, uh, uh, for at that time what seemed like a lot of money and he, I said to him well how much would you pay me and this is another thing I want to I want to impress upon you. Um, Compensation isn't everything, all right? There's more to life than compensation. Finding the right opportunity for yourself and building your career and building good experience is more important than compensation, especially earlier, early in your career. And my wife and I sat down and we talked about this. We prayed about this. Uh, we thought about it. We were, we were making, the salary that they were offering me was one-third of what we were making at that time. One-third. Fortunately, we didn't have a, a lot, we didn't have any debt. We, we were renting a house. Um, I think we may have had a car payment, which you got, we didn't? No, all right, good, because I've always told my kids never have a car payment. Um, so we didn't, we didn't have a car payment either. So we had, we had no debt, no credit card debt, no nothing. We, we were living pretty cheaply. So we were able to be flexible and make a decision that was better for my career in the long run rather than having to pay bills right now. <coughs> There's another thing to remember. Don't get yourself in debt. Don't do it because it, 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 it straps you. It doesn't give you the freedom that you need to be able to make decisions. And to be able to make decisions best based upon the long haul rather than right then having to pay a bill, right? You got, you got a mortgage facing, you got a car payment facing, you're so fixed on that that you get lost in that and you forget about what's more important which is building a career, building your skill set, making yourself more marketable. So we took this job at Kaufman & Broad. So once again another relationship had paid off for me. I went from being a no-name consultant to working for the largest developer in the state of California, a Fortune 500 traded company, publicly traded company. And, and, and my wife and I sat down and we talked about it. We said, okay, well, we can keep doing one deal here, one deal there, and then having to sell it for a fee and not be able to own the deal and benefit from cash flow from the million other things. Or we can go work for the largest developer in the state and do 20 deals a year. And think of all the experience you're gonna gain in doing that. And we thought that was a better decision, so we took this job. And 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 going looking back on it now, it was it was a great decision at that point in our lives. Because as my wife mentioned, those numbers, I don't know if you caught that, but over the next ten years I was a part of, directly a part of, not indirectly, directly part of over two hundred and fifty affordable housing communities across the country, all the way from here, Hawaii, Pala, Palahua Terrace 1 and 2 in Makakilo, uh, Kapolei, Hawaii, an affordable housing project that I did right over here, all the way to Puerto Rico. <coughs> and then everywhere, everywhere you can imagine in between, everywhere. I don't think I went to Delaware. I don't think I had, I don't think I had one in Maine either. But we were in something like 37 states as well. Over almost 24,000 units of apartments. And every type of financing that you could imagine every type of financing that you can imagine. Lottery winnings that were designated for affordable housing, home funds, CDB, 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 CDBG block grant funds, um, uh, any, any type of fun, fun, housing that would help to create affordable housing, we were a part of it in every state, talking with counties, talking with cities. It was a tremendous experience, one that there's no way in the world I could have duplicated that experience even as a consultant. To be able to be exposed to that many different people across the country, to be able to, to, be, able to be exposed to that many different types of deals across the country, and that many deal, types of structures was invaluable to us. And so we worked for the next 10 years with Kaufman and Broad. Um, I had always known, well actually five of those years Coffin and Brown, then we were acquired by a group from uh, Denver called Simpson. The last five were with, with, uh, with uh, this group called Simpson at Denver. And I had always, um, I had always uh, uh, wanted to, to, to start my own company. That was something that I'd always wanted to do, but I, I, it was critical to me though, from my, my beginnings as an accountant, 
to being a part of that that group in Southern California for those for 18 months, and then coming to Kaufman and Broad and watching what they watching what they could accomplish with the right financial backing. Um, it was it was critical to me to make sure I had certain things lined up to be able to start my own group. Um, I got invited to a, a, what I would call a boondoggle at the Ritz-Carlton in Laguna Niguel, California, which is just down the street from our house, probably 15 minutes from our house. I was traveling a lot at that time. I decided, you know what, I'll just go down there during the day to this, the, uh, Ber Berkshire Mortgage. You know Warren, Warren Buffett? You guys have heard of Warren Buffett? Right, the, the Oracle of Omaha. Berkshire Mortgage is his company, and they were financing some, some projects for us uh, through Freddie Mac. And they had this boondoggle at the Ritz Carlton where they brought in an economist and he talked to us and then we all went and played golf and then we had dinner and got the next morning and they had some other meetings that were educational for us and just kind of thanking us for the business. And so I was going to go to this and, I, and we, we had uh, five kids at the time. They were all young and, and, and I felt like, you know, I'm gone a lot so I don't want to be out another night so I'll just stay home. You know, it's rather stay at the hotel, come home every night and, and help help. Sister Shepherd put the, the kids to bed and do those kinds of things. And so I, I told her that morning, and she looked at me and she said, you've got to be kidding me. You have a room at the Ritz-Carlton and we're not going? <laughs> and I said, sorry. And she goes, I'll get a babysitter. So she got a babysitter. And we went to the Ritz-Carlton that night. And we're, we went to dinner, and, and at dinner, uh, because I was just, it was just supposed to be me at the dinner, um, I couldn't sit at the table that I had been assigned to because I, I had my wife with me. So they put us at a different table. And they sat us next to a gentleman by the name of Deloy Hansen, who uh, Brother Blazer knows uh, from Logan, Utah. Deloy's a high, high net worth individual. If you, anybody know the Real Salt Lake, the professional soccer team, yeah, De Deloy owns the team. He owns the stadium. He owns all that. He's, he's Deloy's a, 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 a very uh, uh, astute real estate uh, professional. Um, so, so it would, Sister Shepherd and Doyle talked for the first hour. I was talking to the guy next to me, and finally, they kind of, uh, she kind of introduced me to Deloy, and Deloy and I started to talk. And Deloy said, uh, he said, I think we have a lot in common, and he said, I, I have about fifteen thousand units of aging apartment units that I need to. This isn't a word. Don't look it up. I need to de-age them. I need to either either spend a lot of money and fix them up. Or I got to sell these and buy some newer ones to replace them and do a 1031 like kind of exchange so you don't pay taxes on it right now, you pay taxes later. He said, he said, but what I could do is this, I could take some of these properties, I can sell them to you, you run them through the tax credit program, I'll take that money, I'll 1031 it into new apartments and I'll de-age my portfolio this way. And I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. I said, also, we want to develop our own along the way. Deloy said, man, that would be fantastic. So this is a, this is a true story. I don't recommend this, all right? But Deloy and I separated that night at about 1030. And he said, I'll see you at 530 tomorrow morning in the lobby of the hotel. And I said, great. And we got up at 530. We laid out five sheets of paper. And Deloy kept these five sheets. And we laid out what we thought would be a company that could develop uh, affordable housing on these five sheets of paper. All the profit centers, everywhere, all along the way, we laid them out like that, and we sat down and we looked at it, and by about seven, we thought that th this could work. And he said, do you know any deals? And I said, well, I got a buddy up here who lives maybe five minutes away from us who's got a, a piece of land up in Hayward, California that he can't do anything with, and I think it would be a great senior project for affordable housing. We called my friend, Kevin Payne, who used to work with me at Kaufman and Broad, another relationship, and said, Kevin, what are you doing? He says, I'm sleeping, Kip, at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I said, well, I'm sitting here with a guy that, that, that I think we want to work with, and, and you still own that land, uh, you still have that land under contract up in Hayward. He said, I do. His partner didn't want to work on that particular deal. He didn't think it was a good deal. I thought it was. And he said, yeah. I said, well, then get down here, because I think we might be able to do something. He came down about 8 o'clock, and by 10 o'clock, we had our own one-page purchase and sell agreement signed with Kevin, and that was our first deal. And that's how it started. Uh, now 6,000 units later, about eight years later, with Deloitte, um, uh, th that, that's kind of where we are with today with this, this company, Wasatch Advantage Group. And I want to spend just a few minutes uh, and walk you through this, but, but I wanted to emphasize with you the power of relationships that you create during the course of your career, wherever you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Uh, those people can come back and be great, uh, great partners with you. The, the, the gentleman 
that that job I took, uh, the first job I took out of the accounting firm, the gentleman who was my direct boss, not the guy who was the Sports Illustrated guy, but the other guy who was the CFO, his name was Graham Espley Jones. Graham is now a partner of mine. He, he runs a nonprofit organization that we bring into our transactions so we can qualify for a property tax abatement of real estate of, of property taxes uh, for, and for real estate in the state of California. He's an, a, 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 an important partner for me now. And he was an, another relationship that we had developed there. Um, I want to try to get this right. He said if I go, there you go. So Wasatch Advantage Group, uh, we started this in 2004. Um, we're kind of based in the Western United States. One thing I learned from my experience of being with a national company was that it's really hard to manage properties across the country. And so I wanted to be, if I couldn't get there in a day on a plane and back, I don't want to do the deal. So that's kind of my, my barometer of whether or not we want to work on a certain transaction or not. Is can we get there on an airplane and back in one day? And so we're in, we're in Colorado, we're in Arizona, we're in Utah, we're in Washington, we're in California. We've tried to do stuff uh, we, we've done stuff in Nevada, but sold it. Tried to do stuff in Oregon, haven't been able to do that yet. Tried to do stuff in Idaho, haven't been able to do that yet either. And we kind of stayed right there, because those are the places I can get to and back in one day on a plane. Um, we, we focus on being able to add value to the community that we're going into, and I'll show you some of those things right now. Um, and then the, the kind of the mission statement down below there is what WAG's objective is to acquire, develop, construct, operate, and own, market rate and affordable multifamily rental communities, senior rental communities, and other special projects that augment and complete the company's vision. I am a strong believer in cash flow, so we don't sell the properties. We've sold two of the properties that we've acquired over the years. That's it. Only, only two. We keep them. We operate them. We manage them. A big part of our success is our manager company. They are, they, what we've really become, to just so you know, is that we've really become uh, operators, managers disguised as developers, is really what we are now. But everything we do is so that we can own and operate it. Uh, that's kind of our core group of companies right there. Uh, Wasatch Advantage Group is the development company. Wasatch Regional Builders is my ground up construction company, full fledged construction company with superintendents and field engineers and estimators and, and vice presidents and project managers. Construction people got more titles than I've ever thought of. Every time I talk to them, they want to hire somebody with a new title. They're, they're always at Wasatch Property Manager. That's our manager company that manages all of our assets. And then Ingenuity Builders, Inc., IBI. They're, they're, so when we acquire an existing property and we want to renovate it and rehab it, that's my construction company for doing that. And that's really myself and another guy in my office. Because what we do is, is we use my capital improvements group from the manager company. So so if there's a, a porch that's broken on an apartment unit, they, this capital improvements group would come in and they would be the ones that would repair the porch. But I also have them come in and do my renovations as well. So it's all in-house. So the very product that they service for the next 15 years is the product that they're installing today. So there's great synergy in that. They understand exactly what's going into the unit. If we're using Whirlpool or whatever appliance or whatever we're doing, they, they, the carpet, the linoleum, everything, it's stuff that they've picked out and they have, and they have you know, 25 years of experience managing so far. So they know exactly what to use. Um, the, my wife mentioned this. We were uh, uh, number eight in both um, development and in acquisition um, in the country. So we, we've become a nationally. I mentioned this, so I thought this was kind of funny. This is the one deal that I did in Hawaii. It's over there at Kapolei. Everybody, everybody kind of know that side of the island over there. It's uh, 147 units of affordable housing. Been a great project. We worked with a local developer and, and joint ventured this one here. Um, Logan Park, this is 661 units in Sacramento. 661 units, that's like a small village. It's huge. Um, this property was, was, was an absolute disaster. It was um, crime ridden, drug ridden. Prostitution was being running out of several of the, of the buildings. It was, it was horrible. It was just horrible. And we, 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 it was so bad that we were very nervous about acquiring it. But we thought, though, that we could come in and clean it up and create some real value. Um, and so we came in and, and, and we did that. And I want to show you some of the things that we did. So we bought this. The rehab was completed in May of 2009. It's about $80 million project, 661 acres on, 661 units on 20 acres. That's pretty dense, 33 units an acre. That's, that's very dense product. And so it's, it's condensed as well. Um, this gives you an idea. That's not that picture. You can't really see that well. But so you can see the clubhouse above. And that's, that's what we did to it afterwards. 
Uh, the clubhouse is important because it draws people in and it gives them a great sense of ownership as well. They walk into this professionally managed clubhouse and they feel good about where they live. One of the other things that we do though is on this particular one is we took one of the buildings that was just being used as a storage area and we, and we turned it into what we call a, a, a life center. And this is where we have all kinds of social services that we provide to the property, after school programs. Um, they do homework there. Uh, they do the character counts program there where they learn values. Um, they do, uh, we actually have a charter school. Um, here's, here we have a, all kinds of clothes giveaways, computer literacy, literacy program. We have a charter school now that, that's run out of that. We've had, we've had 11 graduates, graduates from our charter school now. Um, we're pre pretty excited about that. This is a list of all of the services that we provide out of this life center to help these people transition into, into a better quality of life. Um, this is a project that we did in downtown Salt Lake City on 3rd East, 1st, South. See that building on the bottom left, my, my left, yeah, your left, bottom left there, Jubilee Center, that's what it was. It was a single story building, 0.8 of an acre. Uh, that's what we turned it into right there. That's a fake car, but that's a real building, okay? <laughs> that's what it really looks like. Uh, five stories, two floors of parking on the bottom, and then five going up, 125 units on 0.8 of an acre, so super dense, right? Um, the parking level. You can see the entrance to the parking right there in the middle of the building. That's how we enter the bottom floor. To enter the second floor, you come up the street over here on the left, you come up and you enter directly under there. So we don't have a ramp in, in, the, in the parking structure, so we didn't lose any spaces at all to a ramp. Very efficient, super efficient. Over, we have over, I think we have 130 parking spaces. This is exact, this is one and a half blocks from the church's two billion dollar development called City Creek. Have you guys heard of that? Where they redeveloped everything south of the temple. And, and uh, we have this 125 units, we have a 200 person waiting list for this project. It's 100% occupied. Um, Olin Walker contributed to this project, uh, a group that uh, the, uh, Blazer is aware of. Just to give you an idea, this, this project is, um, about as complicated as you can make real estate, all right? Um, I, I put this, the, the kind of the sources up here up above. So we sold the tax credits to, uh, uh, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank, Goldman. We sold the tax credits to Goldman. Uh, we did the financing. The financing was actually tax exempt bonds that were credit enhanced through FHA, the 221D4 program, and then they were bought back by the Treasury Department as part of the, um, the HERA bill that was passed by President Obama. So our all in interest rate for 40 years on this fix is 3.2%. That's, that's really good money, guys. Um, we then went and got um, $2 million from the federal government. We got $800,000 from the Olin Walker Housing uh, Trust Fund, and we got $200,000 from the Salt Lake City Housing Trust Fund. This closing was, was just a nightmare. I mean, we were in a big room. There were documents everywhere. I, did, I had to sign over 90 documents at the closing. We had, there were 14 different sets of attorneys that were working on this transaction. It was, it was, it was intense, um, but a beautiful, beautiful project. We had a great article written about us. There's a mayor, a quote from the mayor of Salt Lake City that talks about the project there. Uh, they, they love it. It turned out great. We then went in Midvale. Everybody familiar with Midvale in the middle of Salt Lake Valley? It's right where the 215 and the 15 cross. There was an old steel plant there called Sharon Steel, and it was a, it was a super fun site, right, and contaminated. The state of uh, Utah came in and bought the land. They then went in and mitigated the, the environmental concern, and they actually they take all of the liability of the environmental, all of it. 100%. I'm not in the chain of, of that at all. And then they sold this off. We bought 56 acres of this 160 acre Superfund site right in the middle of, of Salt Lake City. And right, right here is a light, wheel, a light rail train stop. And it goes up around here that way and goes out further south in the valley comes down here, turns, and goes to downtown Salt Lake City. So all of my residents can walk two minutes to a light rail train stop and be 20 minutes from a major employment center. We've done uh, four communities on this property, two market rate communities, and two tax credit communities. We did a 76 unit senior community, which averages 40% area median income rents for the residents that live there. Uh, it's super affordable for seniors that are on fixed incomes. And then we had a 214 unit family of 
affordable housing project. Had a great article in the Salt Lake Tribune about our residents there. The type of people who live in affordable housing that's done through tax credit programs. This isn't what you're envisioning. It isn't section eight subsidized housing. This family that they profiled is exactly what our families are. He's a school teacher married with two kids. We get first year policemen, first year fire. They have to have an income in order to live in our property. This is for the working poor, not for the non-working poor. Uh, Bingham Junction, this, the, 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 uh, the EPA loved this so much that they actually did a 12 minute video on it. If you want to, you need something to put you to sleep one day, go ahead and watch that. Um, and that's some stuff that they talked about. You can see right here, that's our affordable project. There's another one there. Um, there's the light rail uh, uh, stop right there. Uh, this is one, this is the market rate pro one of the market rate properties on that site. This is the affordable property on that site right here. You, you can't tell that from a market rate. I just showed you market rate here, and then this is affordable. They they, they look the same. It's great stuff, and and uh, people feel great about living there. This affordable one actually got written up in a, a trade journal as well. Right there, it's called Florentine Villas. That's a picture of it right there. Um, Tuscan Villas, this is the senior one that I talked to you about right there. Four stories elevator. Um, that also got written up in a magazine. Um, this, is, this is the property that my daughter manages actually, that's on this property. She, she manages this one, they, they live in San Moritz and she's the financial manager for this property here. And this is our last development that we have left on this property. We're gonna do another, another um, uh, 192 units that we're gonna start actually next month on that property. So we took 56 acres of unusable land and we turned it into this thriving community that is not only just a community, but it's also a campus of incomes as well. All those properties, we, we have strategically set the rents in all those properties so that they're, 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 there's a variation of, of incomes that can live on this, on this property here. Um, this was a, uh, one of those special projects that I mentioned that we did. Uh, the city of Richmond, California, um, we went in and we redeveloped and renovated their entire civic center. It had built in the it had been built in 1948, and 1950, and the Loma Prieta earthquake it had been shut down. And since 1989 uh, until 19 until, until 2006, it had been empty and just sitting there and was a blight not only on the community but, specific, but specifically on their downtown area. There was just nothing going on. It was just dying and shriveling up. And they came in and asked us as a developer if we would help them. There was supposed to be housing involved in it, but when we got going on this was in 2007, right when the world stopped for housing. And so we were able to just work on this part of it. Um, $78 million on one phase, another $22 million on another phase, $110 million, uh, $100 million, they put $10 million their own in of, of renovation. Uh, it won all kinds of awards. Uh, we were lead uh, green, uh, excuse me, lead, gold lead on it and we won all kinds of other uh, awards for it. It turned out to be beautiful. Uh, the, we had an art budget that we had an eight million dollar art budget. Um, and the art in here is incredible that, that we put in this, this uh, Civic Center. I didn't pick any of it out, but it, it's, it's incredible. Um, as a result of that project in Richmond, a guy who was the city manager in Richmond, California, took a job in Burien, Washington, and became the city manager in Burien, Washington. And he called me up and said, Kip, I need your help. I saw what you did for me at Richmond. Can, can you do something for me here in Burien? We have this stop that goes directly into Seattle, and we have no parking for it, but the express buses come here, and then they need someplace to park so they can then get on the bus and go into Seattle. And so we created this uh, parking structure for them uh, and built that for them there. Um, I, I could, th this is like a, an, an hour description, too, of all kinds of layers of financing and things like that that we did there. Um, do you have an idea of the detail that we go into? What we did is in order to make sure that we're as efficient as we can be because we're a small group, um, and we try to be as efficient. We took, every, we took the function of affordable housing and we broke it up into tasks. And these are all the tasks that we go through in order to build an affordable housing project. And we did that so that we can then why is that not going? There it is. You saw, that was a long list. I didn't want to walk through that list and be bored to death. But we did that so we create this flow chart of all the different functions. And then we looked around the room and we said, now who do we have here in our company that can fill these functions e efficiently for us? And that's how we structured our group in doing that. Um, I, I would like to spend more time with you on that because that's, that's actually as tedious as it is. It's, it's incredibly interesting because it helps you get the very best out of your people. 
Uh, I want to just close with a couple things. Integrity and passion. Uh, here's a quote by Elder Dallin H. Oaks. We should also remember that honesty and truthfulness are not valuable unless they're absolute. You cannot place much trust in a person who tells you the truth 95% of the time. The same is true of a, an employee or partner who doesn't steal 95% of the time. Integrity is, is absolute, you guys. I, I can't tell you how important it is. If I have someone who I think is only going to steal from me 1% of the time, that person is a total liability for me because I never know when that 1% is going to be. I have no idea. Have absolute integrity in everything that you do. That way you become valuable to your employer. Um, he had another quote here. Uh, there's nothing that business people and professionals should be more interested in than the level of integrity and the entire moral tone that prevails in the United States of America. Um, passion. I asked my boys just the other day, and one of them got it right, but I, we talked about it all the time. I always ask them, how, many, how long does your dad work? And they say what? Life. Yeah. What, what do you say? Not a day in your life. I've never worked a day in my life. I, because I'm, I'm fortunate. I get to go do what I'm passionate about. I get to go to my hobby every morning. Now, I know that everybody's hobby is going to be something that can, that can provide for your family. I, I get that. But find what you're passionate about. I read an article years ago in the Wall Street Journal that I actually made my boys read and bring it to family meeting and talk about. And in that article, it was a typical article about what happens if you have a high school diploma, what's your earning power? What happens if you have a college uh, degree, what's your earning power? And it was, everybody can predict that, right? We, we all know what the answers are. Then it said, it got a little more interesting, it said, what happens if you have a liberal arts degree? What happens if you have a, a uh, science or math degree? And that was a little more interesting, right? Then it got even more and he said, what happens if you went to a public school, a public or a state university, versus a private institution? And then that got a little more interesting as well, what, what, what your earning power could be. What your earning, and then he said, and he thought there's going to be some grand conclusions, and he said, now stop, throw everything out the window. If you don't have passion in what you're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Now, don't anybody walk out of here thinking, I just told you not to go to school, okay? That's not what I said. You go to school, you get as much education as you can. You become as, as, as intelligent and knowledgeable and skilled as you possibly can. And then you keep going back and get more knowledge and more skill. It never ends, all right? Uh, I want to read this quote from President Hinckley. To your business or your employer, you have an obligation. Be honest with your employer. Do not do church work on his time. Be loyal to him. He compensates you and expects results from you. You need employment to care for your family. Without it, you cannot be an effective church worker. That goes back to that integrity again that I was talking about. Um, I'm running out of time. That's good. Open up for questions. Open up for questions. Anybody have a, uh, have a question for me? How important was your wife along the road that you just described to this group? There, there's nothing that I've done that I haven't bounced off my wife. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Makes me emotional. <laughs> um, she's, she's absolutely a partner in everything that I do. My question is for your wife. <laughs> I mean, how do you handle that? He's making all these big jumps and taking these risks, and how do you just, how do you just hold on and go with it? You know, it really didn't matter how much we were making. It was whether or not he was happy doing it. And he was so unhappy doing it. That it at that point, look, let's just go with it. You know, at the, at the very least, I can get a job at Walmart. He can get a job at Mervyn's. We can, we can make it work. You know, I mean, it, 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 As long as you have no debt. As long as you have no debt. And, and, and that's where we work. So we just figured that, you know what, why not give it a shot? You know, if that's what's going to make you happy and that's what you want to do, then let's go for it. So at that point, you know, that was kind of, you know, and that's kind of been the way that it's been all the way through. We've kind of managed everything so that um, ultimately our goal was not to make a huge amount of money. Our goal was that we could live comfortably within our means doing what we enjoy doing. I've asked this question to all the speakers who have come to this series. If you could give any recommendation to these students here, what class would you recommend that they would take to be the most helpful to them in a business career? Accounting. <laughs> that's, that, that's easy. That's easy. Accounting. To understand the inflows and outflows of cash running through your business is, is critical. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And accounting is, is the discipline that teaches you that. May I also comment, 
That's the same answer I've got from every one of you. <laughs> Is it really? Well, I wanted to end with this. Is there anyone, any other questions? I wanted to end with this. Uh, my, my wife touched upon this about being happy, and that's certainly very, very important to us. But the main, the main purpose for us has always been is we decided early on uh, that we wanted to be builders of the kingdom of God here on the earth. Um, everything we've done has been so that we can do that. We can be a part of this great work that we're a part of. That's inviting our friends and neighbors to come into Christ. That's asking those who have strayed to return and come back to Christ. Uh, that's, that's our sole purpose in what we do. We, we love what we do outside of that, but we're trying, to, we're trying to create a world where we can spend our time being builders of the kingdom. That's, that's what we're here for. Uh, brothers and sisters, I, I leave you my testimony that God lives. That he loves each one of us. And that Jesus Christ is our Savior. I testify to you, we have a prophet today, and what a blessing that is in our life to be led and guided and directed by a prophet. Think of the advice over the years, the counsel over the years that he's given us. It has been so instrumental uh, for me and my business. When we've been told about hard times coming your way, boy, there were people that should have paid attention to President Hinckley years ago about what was coming. Uh, they're not... They're subtle hints, they're subtle counsel, but listen. Every, every six months we have a chance to hear from our prophet, listen to him. Uh, grateful, grateful for him, grateful for the prophet Joseph Smith, grateful for the Book of Mormon. Um, and his, his work in bringing that about. Um, I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.